Memory in computers may get bigger and better all the time, but the same just can't be said for the human computer. Memory in people is finite, fickle, and perhaps fleeting. For 10 questions on human memory, we welcome Graham Cullingridge, a recent winner of the Brain Prize, often referred to as the Nobel of Neuroscience. Graham Cullingridge is chair of the Department of Physiology at the University of Toronto and a senior investigator at the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute at Mount Sinai Hospital. You ready for 10, ten questions on memory? Uh, I'll do my best. Here we go. Number one, will doing more crossword puzzles and Sudoku puzzles actually help your memory? Probably. <laughs> it's very hard to get hard scientific evidence on these things, but it makes common sense to myself, somebody who understands a molecular basis of learning and memory, that more use of the synapses, the connections between nerve cells to make them stronger is going to protect the brain against dementia. But it ain't necessarily so. It's not necessarily so, but it's probably a good thing to do. I would recommend it. Question two, are there foods that can boost our brain power? Uh, again, most probably there is. But not hard to say sure. exactly which ones. Getting hard scientific evidence on this is very difficult. But generally, foods which are good for the body are good for the mind. Question three, which of the five senses is or are most tied to memory? That depends on the species that one's considering. If you're talking about us, probably vision, because we're very visually uh, directed animals. But if you talk about rodents, for example, then it's probably in the sense of smell. Huh. Question four, why do people have such clear memories of, for example, where they were on 9-11, where they were when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, etc. Mm -hmm. That's because it's important for us. We cannot store everything. So there has to be mechanisms that enable us to remember very important events. It's part of normal survival. If something's really threatening, you need to be able to learn and remember it. And basically, 9-11, though it might not be personally threatening to us, it's still never a, a lesser traumatic event. And therefore, there are mechanisms in the brain that we partly understand now, which signals to the memory processes, this is important. We've got to remember this. Question five, how does post-traumatic stress relate to the way memories are formed? Well, again, post-traumatic stress is a form of memory of an important event. Uh, so, for example, take a soldier in a very difficult wartime situation. They have to form memories for their own survival. But when they come back, some of those memories aren't erased, and then that can lead to a stressful situation. Question six, why can't some people remember their early childhood? Very, well, most people cannot remember what happens in the first few years of life because the parts of the brain that are responsible for those long-term memories are still forming. So, and the emphasis on early learning and memory is to learn the essential skills of life, such as how to walk, talk, et cetera, et cetera. So that is what the learning emphasis is on early in development. But even age five, six, seven, eight, a lot of people have trouble accessing that. Yeah, I mean, I speak for myself. I can remember little bits of when mm -hmm. I was five, six, and seven. I think that's just normal human memory development processes. Hmm. Question seven, is it possible to implant false memories in someone? At the moment, no, but in principle, yes. Because it does happen, eh? Well, what can happen is, and this is, this is quite worrying, and that is memories are not perfect. So if you think you recall an event, but as you remember that event, it can be modified. It becomes labile again. And this, this has issues for the reliability, for example, of witnesses in court cases. If they've been interviewed several times about the event, it could actually be slightly modified in their own mind. Hmm. Question eight, does illicit drug use damage memory? Can do, particularly depending on the drugs. I mean, uh, high dose uh, THC right, in marijuana. cannabis, marijuana would definitely have an impact on learning and memory. Which are the worst? In terms of learning and memory, hmm. that's probably one of the worst. Um, some of the worst drugs are probably not affecting learning and memory. Hmm. So it's okay to do cocaine binges because it won't affect your memory that much. But yeah, but it'd have other adverse <laughs> it effects. Might have other <laughs> effects. Uh, question nine What about alcohol? Uh, high dose alcohol will definitely impair learning and memory. Uh, so in the acute phase, if somebody has a lot to drink, they'll have problems recalling the events of that occasion. A more serious problem is chronic alcohol abuse can lead to birth defects, and that's a very serious problem too. How permanently does it affect memory if you abuse alcohol? If it's chronic, then the, uh, the, the effects on the unborn child 
once they're born, that, can, that, that could be a lifetime disability. Hmm. Question 10. If you're thinking of pulling an all-nighter before an exam, should you at least try to get some sleep? There's incredibly good evidence now that sleep is good for the consolidation of memories. So if you cram and cram and cram and don't sleep, you're going to struggle to recall the information. So it's a waste of time. I would always recommend trying, if possible, to get as much sleep as possible before an exam. Catch a few winks if you can. If you can, yeah. Gotcha. Graham, thanks so much for this. You're welcome. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.